Section 6 of Supernatural Horror in Literature by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Nater. Supernatural Horror in Literature by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Section 6. Spectral Literature on the Continent. Section 6 of Supernatural Horror in Literature by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This Legamus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Piotr Natter. Spectral Literature on the Continent On the Continent, literary horror fared well. Celebrated short tales and novels of Ernst Todor Wilhelm Hoffmann, 1776-1822, are a byword for mellowness of background and maturity of form though they incline to levity and extravagance, and lack the exalted moments of stark, breathless terror, which a less sophisticated writer might have achieved. Generally, they convey the grotesque rather than the terrible. Most artistic, of all the continental weird tales, is the German classic Undine, 1814, by Friedrich Heinrich Karl, Baron de la Motte Fouquet. In this story, of a water spirit who married a mortal, and gained human soul, there is a delicate fineness of craftsmanship, which makes it notable in any department of literature, and an easy naturalness which places it close to the genuine folk myth. It is in fact derived from a tale told by the Renaissance physician and alchemist Paracelsus in his treatise on elemental sprites. Undine, daughter of a powerful water prince, was exchanged by her father as a small child for a fisherman's daughter, in order that she might acquire a soul by wedding a human being. Meeting the noble youth, Huldbrand, at the cottage of her foster father by the sea, at the edge of a haunted wood, she soon marries him and accompanies him to his ancestral castle of Ringstetten. Huldbrand, however, eventually wearies of his wife's supernatural affiliations and especially of the appearances of her uncle, the malicious woodland waterfall spirit Kuleborn a wariness increased by his growing affection for Bertalda, who turns out to be the fisherman's child for whom Undine was changed. At length, on a voyage down the Danube, he is provoked by some innocent act of his devoted wife to utter the angry words which consign her back to her supernatural element, from which she can, by the laws of her species, return only once to kill him, whether she will or no, if ever he prove unfaithful to her memory. Later, when Huldbrand is about to be married to Bertalda, Undine returns for her sad duty and bears his life away in tears. When he is buried among his fathers in the village churchyard, a veiled, snow-white female figure appears among the mourners, but after the prayer is seen no more. In her place is seen a little silver spring, which murmurs its way almost completely around the new grave, and empties into a neighboring lake. The villagers show it to this day, and say that Undine and her Huldbrand are thus united in death. Many passages and atmospheric touches in this tale reveal Fouquet as an accomplished artist in the field of the macabre, especially descriptions of the haunted wood with its gigantic snow-white man and various unnamed terrors, which occur early in the narrative. Not so well known as Undine, but remarkable for its convincing realism and freedom from Gothic stock devices, is the Amber Witch of Wilhelm Meinhold, another product of the German fantastic genius of the earlier 19th century. This tale, which is laid in the time of the Thirty Years' War, purports to be a clergyman's manuscript found in an old church at Koserov and centers around the writer's daughter, Maria Schweidler, who is wrongly accused of witchcraft. She has found a deposit of Amber, which she keeps secret for various reasons, and the unexplained wealth obtained from this lends color to the accusation, an accusation instigated by the malice of the wolf-hunting nobleman Wittich Appelmann, who has vainly pursued her with ignoble designs. The deeds of a real witch, who afterward comes to a terrible supernatural end in prison, are glibly imputed to the hapless Maria, and after a typical witchcraft trial, with forced confessions under torture, she is about to be burned at the stake, when saved just in time by her lover, a noble youth from a neighboring district. Meinhold's great strength is in his air of casual and realistic verisimilitude, which intensifies our suspense and sense of the unseen by half persuading us that the menacing events must somehow be either the truth or very close to the truth. 
indeed so thorough is this realism that a popular magazine once published the main points of the amber witch as an actual occurrence of the seventeenth century in the present generation german horror fiction is most notably represented by hans heinz evers who brings to bear on his dark conceptions an effective knowledge of modern psychology novels like the sorcerer's apprentice and alrune and short stories like the spider contain distinctive qualities which raise them to a classic level but france as well as germany has been active in the realm of weirdness victor Hugo, in such tales as hans of iceland and balzac in the wild ass's skin seraphita and louis lambert both employ supernaturalism to a greater or less extent though generally only as a means to some more human end and without the sincere and demonic intensity which characterizes the born artist in shadows it is in theophile gautier that we first seem to find an authentic french sense of the unreal world and here there appears a spectral mystery which though not continuously used is recognizable at once as something alike genuine and profound short tales like avatar the foot of the mummy and clarimonde display glimpses of forbidden vistas that allure tantalize and sometimes horrify whilst the egyptian visions evoked in one of cleopatra's nights are of the keenest and most expressive potency gautier captured the inmost soul of eon weighted egypt with its cryptic life and cyclopean architecture and uttered once and for all the eternal horrors of its nether world of catacombs where to the end of the time millions of stiff spiced corpses will stir up in the blackness with glassy eyes awaiting some awesome and unrelatable summons gustave flaubert ably continued the tradition of gautier in orgies of poetic fantasy like the temptation of saint anthony and but for a strong realistic bias might have been an arch wearer of tapestry terrors later on we see the stream divide producing strange poets and fantasists of the symbolic and decadent schools whose dark interests really center more in abnormalities of human thought and instinct than in the actual supernatural and subtle storytellers whose thrills are quite directly derived from the night black veils of cosmic unreality of the former class of artists of sin the illustrious poet baudelaire influenced vastly by poe is the supreme type whilst the psychological novelist joris karl huismans a true child of the eighteenth nineties is at once the summation and finale the latter and purely narrative class is continued by prosper merime whose venus of ille presents in terse and convincing prose the same ancient statue bright theme which thomas moore cast in ballad form in the ring the horror tales of the powerful and cynical guy de montpassant written as his final madness gradually overtook him present individualities of their own being rather the morbid outpourings of a realistic mind in a pathological state than the healthy imaginative products of a vision naturally disposed toward fantasy and sensitive to the normal illusions of the unseen nevertheless they are of the keenest interest and poignancy suggesting with marvellous force the eminence of nameless terrors and the relentless dogging of an ill-starred individual by hideous and menacing representatives of the outer blackness of these stories the horla is generally regarded as the masterpiece relating the advent to france of an invisible being who lives on water and milk sways the minds of others and seems to be the vanguard of a horde of extraterrestrial organisms arrived on earth to subjugate and overwhelm mankind the stance narrative is perhaps without a peer in its particular department notwithstanding its indebtedness to a tale by the american fitz james o'brien for details in describing the actual presence of the unseen monster other potently dark creations of de montpassant are who knows the spectre he the diary of a madman the white wolf on the river and the grisly verses entitled horror the collaborators erkman chatrian enriched french literature with many spectral fancies like the man wolf in which a transmitted curse works toward its end in a traditional gothic castle setting their power of creating a shuddering midnight atmosphere was tremendous despite the tendency toward natural explanations and scientific wonders and few short tales contain greater horror than the invisible eye where a malignant old hag weaves nocturnal hypnotic spells which induce the successive occupants of a certain inn chamber to hang themselves on a crossbeam 
the owl's ear and the waters of death are full of engulfing darkness and mystery the latter embodying the familiar overgrown spider theme so frequently employed by weird fictionists villiers de lille adam likewise followed the macabre school his torture by hope the tale of a stake condemned prisoner permitted to escape in order to feel the pangs of recapture being held by some to constitute the most harrowing short story in literature this type however is less a part of the weird tradition than a class peculiar to itself the so-called conte cruel in which the wrenching of the emotions is accomplished through dramatic tantalizations frustrations and gruesome physical horrors almost wholly devoted to this form is the living writer maurice level whose very brief episodes have lent themselves so readily to theatrical adaptation in the thrillers of the grand guignol as a matter of fact the french genius is more naturally suited to this dark realism than to the suggestion of the unseen since the latter process requires for its best and most sympathetic development on a large scale the inherent mysticism of the northern mind a very flourishing though till recently quite hidden branch of weird literature is that of the jews kept alive and nourished in obscurity by the sombre heritage of early eastern magic apocalyptic literature and cabalism the semitic mind like the celtic and teutonic seems to possess marked mystical inclinations and the wealth of underground horror lore surviving in ghettos and synagogues must be much more considerable than is generally imagined cabalism itself so prominent during the middle ages is a system of philosophy explaining the universe as emanations of the deity and involving the existence of strange spiritual realms and beings apart from the visible world of which dark glimpses may be obtained through certain secret incantations its ritual is bound up with mystical interpretations of the old testament and attributes an esoteric significance to each letter of the hebrew alphabet a circumstance which has imparted to hebrew letters a sort of spectral glamour and potency in the popular literature of magic jewish folklore has preserved much of the terror and mystery of the past and when more thoroughly studied is likely to exert considerable influence on weird fiction the best examples of its literary use so far are the german novel the golem by gustav meiring and the drama the dibuk by the jewish writer using the pseudonym anski the former with its haunting shadowy suggestions of marvels and horrors just beyond reach is laid in prague and describes with singular mastery that city's ancient ghetto with its spectral peaked gables the name is derived from a fabulous artificial giant supposed to be made and animated by medieval rabbis according to a certain cryptic formula the dibuk translated and produced in america in 1925 and more recently produced as an opera describes with singular power the possession of a living body by the evil soul of a dead man both golems and dibuks are fixed types and serve as frequent ingredients of later jewish tradition End of section six.